The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Chapter 10 Schaveningham. Outside Harlem, the bus took the south road, paralleling the sea. On our right rose the low, sandy hills of the dune country. Soldiers silhouetted on the ridges. Clearly, we were not being taken to Amsterdam. A two-hour drive brought us instead into the streets of The Hague. The bus stopped in front of a new, functional building. Word was whispered back that this was Gestapo headquarters for all of Holland. We were marched, all but Pickwick, who seemed unable to rise out of his seat, into a large room where the endless process of taking down names, addresses, and occupations began all over again. On the other side of the high counter running the length of the room, I was startled to see Willemses and Captain. As each of the prisoners from Harlem reached the desk, one or the other would lean forward and speak to a man seated at a typewriter, and there would be a clatter of sound from the machine. Suddenly, the chief interrogator's eye fell on Father. That old man, he cried, did he have to be arrested? You old man? Willem led Father up to the desk. The Gestapo chief leaned forward. I'd like to send you home, old fellow, he said. I'll take your word that you won't cause any more trouble. I could not see Father's face, only the erect carriage of his shoulders and the halo of white hair above them. But I heard his answer. If I go home today, he said evenly and clearly, tomorrow I will open my door again to any man in need who knocks. The amiability drained from the other man's face. Get back in line, he shouted. Schnell, this court will tolerate no more delays. But delays seemed all that this court existed for. As we inched along the counter, there were endless repetitions of questions, endless consulting of papers, endless coming and going of officials. Outside the windows, the short winter day was fading. We had not eaten since the rolls in water at dawn. Ahead of me in line, Betsy answered, unmarried for the 20th time that day. Number of children, droned the interrogator. I'm unmarried, Betsy repeated. The man did not even look up from his papers. Number of children, he snapped. No children, said Betsy resignedly. Toward nightfall, a stout little man wearing the yellow star was led past us to the far end of the room. The sound of scuffling made us all look up. The wretched man was attempting to hold on to something clutched in his hands. It's mine, he kept shouting. You can't take it. You can't take my purse. What madness possessed him? What good did he imagine money would do him now? But he continued to struggle to the obvious glee of the men around him. Here, Jew, I heard one of them say. He lifted his booted foot and kicked the small man in the back of his knees. This is how we take things from a Jew. It made so much noise. That was all I could think as they continued to kick him. I clutched the counter to keep from falling myself as the sounds continued. Wildly, unreasonably, I hated the man being kicked. Hated him for being so helpless and so hurt. At last, I heard them drag him out. Then all at once, I was standing in front of the chief questioner. I looked up and met Captain's eyes, just behind him. This woman was the ringleader, he said. Through the turmoil inside me, I realized it was important for the other man to believe him. What Mr. Captain says is true, I said. These others, they know nothing about it. It was all my name, the interrogator inquired imperturbably. Cornelia Temboom, and I'm the... Age, 52. The rest of these people had nothing to do occupation. But I've told you a dozen times, I burst out in desperation. Occupation, he repeated. It was a dark night when we were marched at last out of the building. The green bus was gone. Instead, we made out the bulk of a large, canvas-roofed army truck. 
Two soldiers had to lift Father over the tailgate. There was no sign of Pickwick. Father, Betsy, and I found places to sit on a narrow bench that ran around the sides. The truck had no springs and bounced roughly over the bomb-pitted streets of the Hague. I slipped my arm behind Father's back to keep him from striking the edge. Wilhelm, standing near the back, whispered back what he could see of the blacked-out city. We'd left the downtown section and seemed to be heading west toward the suburb of Schaveningham. That was our destination then, the federal penitentiary named after this seaside town. The truck jerked to a halt. We heard a screech of iron. We bumped forward a few feet and stopped again. Behind us, massive gates clanged shut. We climbed down to find ourselves in an enormous courtyard surrounded by a high brick wall. The truck had backed up to a long, low building. Soldiers prodded us inside. I blinked in the white glare of the bright ceiling lights. Noses to the wall. I felt a shove from behind and found myself staring at cracked plaster. I turned my eyes as far as I could, first left, then right. There was Willem. Two places away from him, Betsy. Next to me on the other side was Twos all like me, standing with their faces to the wall. Where was father? There was an endless wait while the scars on the wall before my eyes became faces, landscapes, animal shapes. Then somewhere to the right, a door opened. Woman prisoners, follow me. The matron's voice sounded as metallic as the squealing door. As I stepped away from the wall, I glanced swiftly around the room for father. There he was, a few feet out from the wall, seated in a straight back chair. One of the guards must have brought it for him. Already, the matron was starting down the long corridor that I could see through the door. But I hung back, gazing desperately at my father, Wilhelm, Peter, all our brave underground workers. Father, I cried suddenly, God be with you. His head turned toward me. The harsh overhead light flashed from his glasses. And with you, my daughters, he said. I turned and followed the others. Behind me, the door slammed closed. And with you. And with you. Oh, Father, when will I see you next? Betsy's hand slipped around mine. A strip of coconut palm matting ran down the center of the wide hall. We stepped onto it off the damp concrete. Prisoners walked to the side. It was the bored voice of the guard behind us. Prisoners must not step on the matting. Guiltily, we stepped off the privileged path. Ahead of us in the corridor was a desk. Behind it, a woman in uniform. As each prisoner reached this point, she gave her name for the thousandth time that day and placed on the desk whatever she was wearing of value. Nolly, Betsy, and I unstrapped our beautiful wristwatches. As I handed mine to the officer, she pointed to the simple gold ring that belonged to Mama. I wriggled it from my fingers and laid it on the desk along with my wallet and paper gilders. The procession down the corridor continued. The walls on both sides of us were lined with narrow metal doors. Now the column of women halted. The matron was fitting a key into one of them. We heard the thud of a bolt drawn back, the screech of hinges. The matron consulted a list in her hand, then called the name of a lady I didn't even know, one of those who had been at Vellum's prayer meeting. Was it possible that that had been only yesterday? Was this only Thursday night? Already the events at the Baye seemed part of another lifetime. The door banged shut, the column moved on. Another door unlocked, another human being closed behind it. No two from Harlem in the same cell. Among the very first names read from the list was Betsy's. She stepped through the door before she could turn or say goodbye, it had closed. Two cells farther on, Nolly left me. 
the clang of those two doors rang in my ears as the slow march continued. Now the corridor branched and we turned left, then right, and then left again. An endless world of steel and concrete. Ten boom, Cornelia. Another door rasped open. The cell was deep and narrow, scarcely wider than the door. A woman lay on the single cart, three others on straw ticks on the floor. Give this one the cot, the matron said. She's sick. And indeed, even as the door slammed behind me, a spasm of coughing wheezed my chest and throat. We don't want a sick woman in here, someone shouted. They were stumbling to their feet, backing as far from me as the narrow cubicle would allow. I'm, I'm so sorry, I began, but another voice interrupted me. Don't be, it isn't your fault. Come on, Frau Mikey's, give her the cot. The young woman turned to me. Let me hang up your hat and coat. Gratefully, I handed her my hat, which she added to a row of clothes hanging from hooks along one wall. But I kept my coat wrapped tight around me. The cot had been vacated, and I moved shakily toward it trying not to sneeze or breathe as I squeezed past my cellmates. I sank down on the narrow bed, then went into a fresh paroxysm of coughs as a cloud of choking black dust rose from the filthy straw mattress. At last, the attack passed and I lay down. The sour straw smell filled my nose. I felt each slat of wood through the thin pallet. I will never be able to sleep in such a bed, I thought. And the next thing I knew, it was morning, and there was a clattering at the door. Food call, my cellmates told me. I struggled to my feet. A square of metal had dropped open in the door, forming a small shelf. Onto this, someone in the hall was placing tin plates filled with steaming gruel. There's a new one here, the woman called, Frau Mikus called, through the aperture. We get five portions. Another tin plate was slammed onto the shelf. If you're not hungry, Frau Micus added, I'll help you with it. I picked up my plate, stared at the watery gray porridge, and handed it silently to her. In a little while, the plates were collected, and the pass-through in the door slammed shut. And I think we'll pause here and continue with reading this next time. Till then. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.